Welcome to Humble Beginnings, a podcast where we uncover the unconventional, more relatable paths to success. In this show, we'll share the stories before the C-suites, board memberships, and appointments, the stories of various upbringings, first jobs, career pivots, educational uncertainties, and more. This is the place to hear about their lives from the GovCon executives themselves. We hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Humble Beginnings. I'm your host, Amanda Ziede, and back with me today to co-host is Marku Young, managing partner of executive advisory firm, Northwind Partners. And we're both super excited today to be joined by our guest, Doug Wagner, CEO of LMI. Thank you for being here today, Doug, and for being willing to share your story with us. Absolutely. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Mark. Good to see you again, brother. Good to see you. All right. So we, we start with your background, of course, as we typically do. So tell us a bit about your upbringing in Alexandria, Virginia. What was your experience like growing up as an only child? Um, so, yeah, I grew, I grew up in Alexandria. And of course, Alexandria, you know, is, is big and there's lots of different parts to it. So I grew up south of Old Town, Alexandria uh, in the Mount, in the Mount Vernon area, which was a really beautiful place to grow up. And um, we weren't too far away from the river. And so I would spend a lot of time there. Uh, with my friends, you know, fishing and that sort of thing. Um, as far as growing up as an only child, you know, when you, when you grow up, you don't know any different, any better. But, you know, I, I did always long to have, you know, a sibling, you know, you know that big brother type because my friends had it. And I was always jealous. Um, but, you know, it also, I think, it taught me to, to make friends, bring friends quickly. Plus, the area that we lived in was very transient. It was your typical middle class, a lot of government folks there, a lot of military folks there. And so so folks were coming and going a lot. But uh, but yeah, yeah, even to this day, I, I kind of I kind of wish I had I had that big brother. So, you know, I'm going to adopt Mark as my older, <laughs> my much older uh, brother. So, Doug, you've done a great job being that quasi uh, quasi big brother. So, uh, you know, just send over the paperwork and, and we can get that. <laughs> Wow, that's a really nice way to start the conversation. We have an adoption, a new brotherhood. It's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Doug, so what did your parents do for work? So my parents were the typical mom and pop business. And they uh, they sold um, construction equipment, safety equipment, welding equipment in uh, in Alexandria. And they shared the duties. My mom was the inside person, if you will. So she, you know, she watched the finances. She, you know, watched the inventory. She dealt with employees and taxes and all that kind of stuff. And that freed my dad up to uh, be, you know, more with customers. He was out there all the time. He was selling. Uh, so I got to see both parts of the typical business, right? There's the, the there's the, the sales part and the outside focus and and of course, someone has to keep an eye on the sword on the inside. So I was able to see both and, and worked with both. And um, really, it's probably my earliest memories is, is being down there, um, you know, with my parents all the way through. I think it was probably after my freshman year of college, they fired me <laughs> and, and said, you know, you're, you're getting a college degree. I was the first to get a degree in my family and you need to go out and have other work experiences. And so, um, so I, I, I started doing that and, and, and they were right, you know, you had to work for someone besides your parents, um, and, and learn how to work with others and not just your parents. And so, uh, but it was, it was a phenomenal experience. I tell people all the time, um, you know, I fortunate to go to Wayne Mary, I was fortunate to get my MBA at Virginia tech, but the best learning experience I had in terms of business was, was being there with my parents and watching how each of them uh, managed the inside and the outside. Awesome. I, I can relate. My parents owned a flower shop and I would work for them in high school. I would leave school early. It was called work study, but I would go work at my parents' shops. It's kind of a kind of a cheat, you know. But they eventually fired me too and we had to move on. But <laughs> nothing like getting a little free labor from a family. It was, it was free labor, but you know, you you really do learn the basics and you know, I learned the you know, the you know, cash flow. I would sit there and say, Why are we having hot dogs for four nights in a row? And <laughs> You know, my mom would sit there, look at my dad and go, well, if your father would be able to go to such and such and get them to pay their invoice, then. <laughs> I love when the parents bring the work home. Yeah. Oh, it's- yeah. <laughs> exactly. There's, it's hard to separate the two. My mom um, owned uh, a special occasions dress shop, you know, for, for proms, weddings, homecoming, that kind of thing. 
And you do get to see how they interact with customers, how they treat people. And, and, uh, and, and that's something that I think I certainly see in you, Doug, and, and you, Amanda, that you guys have carried that certainly into adulthood, into a professional career. Um, but, but, you know, candidly, yes, our parents got a little bit of free labor, but you get a leg up on, on, on uh, understanding human inter- interaction, and how to build relationships. Yeah, we absolutely do. So now, you know, Doug, we get to, to, to figure out what you were able to do in your part time when you weren't going to school, you know, in your free time, when you weren't going to school and you weren't working part time for, for or maybe full time for your parents. Like, you know, what were you involved in any extracurriculars in grade school? And, you know, what were, what were your interests? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I probably tried just about every in, in grade school, probably tried just about every sport out there. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm 59, so soccer was kind of a new thing. I mean, right now it's just the standard, right? Every 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 child in America, I think, plays it. But it was it was it was a new thing in the 70s, and so uh, so at a young age, uh, played soccer, but I also played baseball and basketball and football, and um, got to uh, got got to high school, um, played played football in high school, um, tried lacrosse. Um, senior year. So again, it was, it was, it was nice. And, 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 you know, if you look at kids right now, it's, it's a shame that you could never do what I would, I did, right. They, they just specialize so early right now. Mm-hmm. And then they get on the travel sports teams. And I mean, you know, when I was, when I was a kid, travel meant, you know, that ele- the elementary school down the street, we'd have to, you know, we'd have to go play, but now it's, it was, my kids were the same way. I mean, you know, traveling on a national level for some of those sports. Yeah. A- absolutely, we see that. Uh, we I, we might have talked about that, Doug. There's such a a focus on specialization, and you don't have much margin. You know, in 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 the '80s, it was really easy to be a, a you know three letter athlete or or play at least more than one sport, especially if you had an interest in something else other than whatever you considered your primary sport. And uh, and kids just can't even do that. I mean, our youngest is uh, a junior in high school, and she's getting to that stage where I mean, they even have. Rec- recruiters, right? Like you talk to somebody to help you. Um, well, they've always had recruiters, but you, you, I think it's like a recruiter specialist that helps you get connected to the recruiters that need to come look for you. And they coach you on what to say and they help you with your highlight reel. And I mean, that was not even, <laughs> it's so yeah. complicated. It was not a thing when we were growing up. So no, it, it's not. And, you know, and, and the other thing, you know, you, you had asked about being an only child. My, I think my, my dad was very aware of that. And so he spent a lot of time with me on the weekends and uh, uh, much of an outdoorsman. So we, we spent a lot of time fishing. We'd go up in the mountains and trout fish, you know, we did some hunting, um, he introduced me to golf, which is, you know, the only sport I could still play right now. Uh, but he introduced me to golf at, you know, at a young age. And then I turned around and got my buddies interested and, you know, we would play the public courses and it's amazing. They didn't kick us off. We had absolutely no idea what we were doing back then, but, uh, but yeah, he, <laughs> I, you know, I thank him for that. You know, he, he introduced me to golf, introduced me to being outdoors. And, yeah. Well, it served you well. Uh, don't, you know, don't let Doug, uh, Doug uh, talk too low of his game, Amanda. He's actually, he's very good. And uh, he is a joy nice. to play with on the golf course. So. Oh, thank you. Um, As you are. So you mentioned, uh, you know, you went to, to, to undergrad William & Mary. What led you there? It was interesting. I mentioned that um, my... Um, I was the first to go to college in my family and my parents were great in, in that they, they, they really didn't know how to make this decision. You know, we, we went and we visited all the schools in Virginia and then I said, well, you know, I, I'm kind of interested in Georgetown. I, I had gone to the Catholic school and at the time in the eight, early eighties, I mean, Georgetown was, you know, it for college basketball. I mean, they, that was the top of their game and, and, um, I didn't want to go too far away. And so that's when my parents gave me another um, economics class and that they said, well, son, we we saved enough for you to go to one of the many fine institutions in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And anything over that is on you. And so then I saw how much Georgetown was compared to in-state schools. So I pretty focused on in-state schools. And um, I went to all boys school. And what it came down to is, you know, I could have gone to UVA. I could have gone to William Mary. I was between the two of them. And just the guys I kind of hung out with and felt more comfortable with. There was a whole bunch of them that, that went to William Mary. There was a whole bunch that went to, to UVA. And just the guys I liked and, and hung around with more went to William Mary. That, that was, 
about the extent of, of why I decided on, on, on William and Mary. So. Got it. You, you mentioned, uh, you know, you worked with, uh, your parents' business or, or, uh, worked there until just after your, your freshman year, they said you're getting a degree, you know, was that, Doug, was that college always a goal for you personally? Was it something just that your parents kind of pushed you to do or instilled that, that desire in you or, or, um, yeah, yeah, it was a desire, but that desire probably, I don't know if that would have been there if it wasn't, if it wasn't for my parents. I mean, that was, that, that was their definition of being a successful parent. If can, can I get, you know, my child to college, you know, something that was just inconceivable, you know, for them to be able to do um, financially, you know, the, the, you know, where they grew up and how they grew up. And, uh, and so they did, they, they talked about it I mean, from a very young age. Well, you know, you're going to have to do well on this class. If you want to go to school, you're going to have to, you know, take, take the AP classes. Don't take these if you want to go to school. I mean, they, they were, so it was just, I mean, it was almost like it, it wasn't an option for me. And, um, and again, they were very supportive. Um, and you know, they, they were very proud that they were able to save and, um, and I know that wasn't easy for them, um, but th- that they wanted to, to pay for that. That meant an awful lot to them. Yeah. We appreciate as, as parents now, we appreciate the sacrifices probably more than, more than appreciate, especially the older we get what they did, uh, for us to be able to do some of the things we get to do. I recall you're a finance major. Is that Very right? Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did, did business always interest you? Now, I, obviously I've, so I mean, we've, Doug and I've known each other probably 16 years. Yeah. It's long wow. enough. Of course, he still likes me, but, uh, but I've always known him as a, as a savvy, uh, business executive, but you know, Doug, for you, was that always the goal in college or? If I wanted to get my parents to pay for college, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they were they they would not have tolerated Doug uh, the the philosophy major or uh, you know I, I was for you know for a hot second I was kind of interested in you know in, in history and you know William and Mary being liberal arts they you know they they really push you to um, you have to study various disciplines right to be able to graduate. And I ended up taking a lot of English. So I said, well, maybe I'll flip, maybe, you know, I'll, you know, English and then I'll go to law school. So that was the other thing, my, you know, my, my parents wanted me to think about law school. Um, but yeah, at, at the end of the day, you know, that's all I knew, again, growing up in a family business. And, um, you know, we were all very practical people. And so, you know, having a business degree was very, very practical. And the way I chose finance was before, when I got there, the business school, even Mary, only had two disciplines, if you will, management or, or accounting. And I found I'm, I'm weird. I found accounting really easy, you know, easy, but then again, I was helping my mom with debits and credits and everything in, in, in the books when I was like, you know, 10, 11 years old. Um, and you know, my dad just, you know, he wanted nothing to do with that. He's like, what do you mean an accountant? You know, why don't, you know, to him, if you studied management, the day you graduate, you know, you're going to be manager of some, some entity. And I'm like, I don't think it works that way. <laughs> and so, um, so as I think going into our junior year, William and Mary said, Hey, we're going to start a, a finance discipline and a marketing discipline next year, which would be my senior year. And me and a fraternity brother of mine, uh, went, you know, went and really lobbied and said, look, all the classes that we would need to take for this finance major we've taken, or we can take next year. Why can't we just go ahead and switch you know, to, to finance? And so, so we got it, just got in under the you know, under the wire. And we were the first two finance majors at, at, at Wow. And cool. it has served me very, 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 very well. That's cool. Do, do, do they have a photo of the two of you up somewhere in the, you know, in the, oh, yeah. <laughs> in, in the, the men's, you know, the, one of the fraternity bathrooms or something like that? <laughs> oh, I'm sure there's a lot of pictures of me and Rich Wong, but, you know, we're gonna... <laughs> That's I, don't think we, I don't think either of us want those out there right now. <laughs> But what was funny is, is, is dad was okay with the finance major and then years. And, that, and that's where I started my career. When, when, I, when I started my career, I started as a, you're doing finance work. And then at, at the old EDS, electronic data systems, that was a phenomenal place to essentially start your career. And they moved me after about five or six years of doing finance work. They said, Hey, we think you'd be great at business development. And so they, they put me into sales. And so I'm talking to my dad and I said, Hey, look, I got, you know, companies moved me into from finance to sales. And he goes, Oh, thank God. They moved you to sales. Finally, you're going to be doing something productive. (laughs) (laughs) 
Because <laughs> again, he was the sales guy for the family business, right? And he just yeah. thought this finance stuff was just, oh, whatever. You know, you're not really contributing. I'm like, well, thanks. I think that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, it, 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 it's, a, it's a phenomenal baseline, you know, I think for anyone is to get that, that finance background. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a really, really, really good baseline. I have, um, I love reflective questions. So I'm going to ask something that's not on our list here, but I'm just curious. So you said you went to an all boys Catholic school growing up. I did. How did that experience prepare you for college? Were there any, you know, values or I guess um, life lessons that that experience has, uh, has, has taught you and has stuck with you since? Um. It was probably somewhat counterproductive oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> to prepare me f- for college. Um, you know, just just being around you know you know other other guys all all day. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My, my my wife would my wife would tell you that she's still reprogramming me from four years of all boys Catholic <laughs> school. Um, but yeah, yeah, I I I, I had I had to. I had to learn to uh, to act differently and um, be a little more mature, and so it was. It was. It was. Now, academically, it prepared me. You know, absolutely, it it did. Socially, yeah, I I had to go through some reprogramming. Quite honestly, yeah. Funny. Okay, it's actually a, a, a it's a common thread amongst lots of our, um, I guess not just execs, but people in the area, like the DMV. A lot of people we've spoken to have gone to Catholic school or private school going, growing up. I don't think I've ever asked that before. And I was just curious because. Yeah. I mean, we did have, um, because I, I, I was able to take uh, AP classes and so our sister school at the time, uh, they didn't, they didn't offer those. And so the girls from the sister school would come over for the AP classes. So I did have a fair fair number of classes with, with, with females and and female friends. And, um, but my parents had decided that, that was just the best academic route. Again, going back to, they wanted to make sure I went to college. And so the school I went to was what they call, you know, a college prep school. And that's what they thought was the best. And I always tell people there's three types of kids that go to, to Catholic school. There's the ones that their parents are, are very devout and my parents were, were devout Catholics, but they're very devout and they, th- they want a, a Catholic based education. Mm-hmm. There's the other third that believe this one more, my parents, we just think that's the best education available. And, and that's, that's, that's our, you know, that's what we believe and that's what we're going to do. And then the other third is, Oh my God, he's a hellion. Let the Catholic straighten his ass out. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was, so it was a weird dichotomy of, of you had, you know, very devout folks. You had kind of the nerds. I'd probably, I'd, I'd be in the nerd category. And then, you know, and then you had the hellions and, <laughs> um, but you know, it wasn't clicky or anything else, you know, guys kind of get along and kind of figure things out. And, you know, if you're arguing in the morning, your best friend by the afternoon. Mm-hmm. Or... Cool. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Just yeah. curious. Thanks for asking. By the way, Ray- Raylene has done a fantastic job on, on you. And Amanda, if, uh, if you've never had a chance to meet Doug's wife, um, if you ever do get to meet her, then you, you, you understand, you know, how great she is. <laughs> and all the work that she's done, but she's, she is, uh, and all the work that she's done. Yes. She's, she's she has, a, a, a just kind of a, an energy about her. And, uh, and, and clearly when, when, um, the two of them go out, it's, it's, you know, Doug's happy to, to step back and not say anything and let her take it all. So, um, cause she does a masterful job of that she's just a wonderful person. So oh, well, thanks, thanks for saying that, but yes, yeah, she, she, I, I, I'm always mischaracterized. I'm actually introverted and she's the extrovert. So Mark's right. We go into a room or, you know, an event or something. She's getting energy from that room. Right. And then for wow. an introvert, you know, we, it exhausts yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> Doug's like, I'll do it. Awesome. I'll do it. I'll go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can relate. Yeah. It's, that's a hard thing to do. Um, back to college, did you work at all while you were attending undergrad, aside from the freshman year summer that you were still working at your parents' shop? Yeah, I I actually wanted to work while I was in school um, down there and, uh, just, you know, just for extra money and, you know, just, you know, a diversion from school. And um, 
and I did, I did a few, you know, odd jobs and things, but that was one of the things my, my parents really didn't want me to do. You know, they, they said, nope, you, you, you know, you shouldn't need money. This is your time to focus on school. And, and then, so I did, but I did work in, in, in the summers. Awesome. Yeah. It's, I, focusing on schoolwork and other things outside is difficult. I didn't either. And there's lots of people who did, and it just seemed like I don't work that way, but some people can do a million things at once, <laughs> but yeah. All right. So what was your first job after undergrad? And if, if I remember correctly, this might've played a part in you um, pursuing your master's degree. So for the most part, the jobs I had in the summertime, they really, you know, they weren't necessarily in an office environment. I think the last job I had maybe between junior and senior year was, was in an office environment, so it was an engineering firm. Um, but my first job between freshman and sophomore year, that was not my parents' job. I was actually, I worked for Washington Gas. Right. Okay. And we were on the cruise that would go, I was on the cruise that would go out and repair, you know, either install new lines or repair lines. Most of the time we were, we were, we were repairing lines and, you know, very blue collar. And you could just, you can imagine how thrilled the crew was to have a 19 year old college guy um, on, on the crew with them. They, they just, uh, they, they love me. I, I wish I could tell you what they call me, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I derogatory what they call me. They never call me by my name. I didn't get called Doug once. That's hilarious. Entire summer. I mean, they rode me like a rented mule. I mean, that was, you know, but again, it was a great learning, <laughs> it was a great learning experience for me. And then the year after, uh, I was a, I was a limo driver. Um, in the long story on how I, how I got that job, but uh, and that that was really interesting. Uh, a limo there. driver. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And then the and then the last year of, of college we worked for the engineering firm. All right. So in why did you decide then to pursue your your business administration degree from Virginia Tech, your master's degree? So um initially I wanted to go um well my 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 goal was that look, I, I think I want to be a CEO. I think I want to, you know, oh, so you had while, that goal in mind. Because I had the finance background, I thought, well, maybe I want to go into investment banking or something like that. And of course, to do that, you, you really have to have a master's degree. And so I was very delusional that, you know, well, the year after I graduate, I'll just go get my, my MBA from Darden at UVA. So I apply, I get the interview, and they really quickly tell me, well, yeah, why don't you come back in four or five years and you know, and get it then. I'm thinking four or five years. That's ridiculous. I mean, 27 or 20, I'm going to stop work. Again, hyper practical person. I'm going to stop work <laughs> for two years, go to Charlottesville. I mean, you really, people are doing that. I didn't realize that that's, that's what you do when the, the top MBA programs, they want you to get some work experience and come back. And I was about to get married and I just, I said, there's this, there's, there's no way. So I said, well, what, what, you know, how else can I get this MBA? And, and the schools were just starting evening programs at the time. Uh, so this was about 19, this would have been 1988, uh, 89. And, um, and Virginia Tech had one in Northern Virginia. And I was working for someone. I'd gone to, to, to EDS. EDS had a great, you know, tuition reimbursement plan. And so I just cranked it out. Um, and, and thank goodness, you know, I, I was married because I, you know, I don't have to worry about anything, just work and then go to school. And looking back, it's amazing, you know, I was able to do that, you know, right? Because back then there was no internet, right? There was no way to, you know, text your classmates. I don't know how we, you know, the, you know, the team, we, we still did a team organ team type of education. I, looking back, I don't know how we schedule all that stuff. Busy people with families and jobs. And somehow we were able to schedule our team meetings and, 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 and get through the MBA. But I am really glad, you know, I, I am really glad now it's unfortunate or, you know, fortunate to how you look at it, you know, MBAs aren't what they used to be. Um, you know, fewer and fewer people get them and, you know, I have employees ask me all the time, should I, should I get one? And, you know, um, you know, most of the time I say, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure really it's worth it unless you go to one of those top schools, you know, like, you know, like a Harvard or, you know, a Wharton or Darden. Um, I, I'm not sure that's worth it like it used to be. But back then, I mean, when back then it was something, I mean, you got that you know, it kind of puts you above everyone else. And that's how EES looked at it. So that was probably also my motivation. Yeah. Um, and quickly want to backtrack. Was the story of becoming a limo driver something we should share? 
Is this a good story? <laughs> oh no, no. It's just uh, my uh, my. <laughs> I was just thinking friends, of it. <laughs> one of my best friends to this day, and, and Mark, you're actually going to get to meet him next week. Uh, his sister. Um, we all kind of grew up together. His sister was a lobbyist, and the lobbying firm had a, a a limo company that they always used. And Kevin was working for them, and I was looking for a job for the summer. I was actually supposed to go back to want to the gas company, and at the last minute. Uh, the union had a fit about all those college kids, and um, and they had they 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 had to pull the offers back, and so I was left without a job like a month before um, the summer started, and so Kevin goes, well, this limo company is dying; they they got too much work, and you know, why don't you come work? It's it's a fun job. So um, so again, you know, like you know, a life lesson right there is that you know how many of us get our jobs from our networks, and um, and that's um, that that that's how I got the limo, the limo driver job. And so yeah, I was up up on the hill a lot. Uh, Barbara Boxer, uh, who was you know long term senator from California, she was a new congresswoman at the time, and and I drove her a lot. Um, so yeah, and, cool. and you know, a few other a few other members. So. Coolest person you ever had the opportunity to drive around? Who the coolest person? Yeah, could have been Barbara. I don't know. <laughs> um, no, she was fun. She, she was, she was, she was, she was, she was a hoot. Um, I can't remember his name, but his book was a big deal back then. The book Megatrends. You guys remember the book? What is it? it it'll, it'll come to me. Um, and he was, he, sta- he was like a standard customer and he, you know, he took a liking to me. So I drove him a lot. So just listening to him, he was a, you know, a, a very famous economist, I believe at the time and, uh, wrote this book called Megatrends, which was extremely popular at the time and a couple other books. And so, yeah, just, it was every time I would, you know, drive him, it was like getting a PhD class level in, in, in economics from him. Cool. Yeah. You just take his brain. Guy. Yeah. He lived, lived off the DuPont circle. And, yeah. That's cool though. I love hearing about people's odd jobs in high school and college. You just never know what a CEO did when they were 21. I was, <laughs> yeah. I, I, when I was 19, I, you know, I was, I was literally <laughs> digging, digging ditches, you know, for Washington gas. Really hands on. It's a good hands on experience. <laughs> it's humbling, but my my parents, yeah. my parents had already humbled me. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I I sent us a little off track, but Doug, I want to um, I want you to take us briefly through your the progression of your career um, and how you ultimately landed at LMI. Um, I know that it's a big question, but just certain opportunities, how they came about, transitional moments. Um, you said that. Becoming a CEO was in your mind earlier on, which is cool. So I'm just curious how you got there. Uh, yeah. So I, my, my first job actually was a finance, financial analyst for Pentagon Federal Credit Union and got that job because uh, a neighbor of ours worked there. So again, network, you're going to, you're going to hear a theme here, but uh, they had a horrible college reimbursement program. <laughs> Back to what we were talking about earlier about, you know, me wanting to get the MBA. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so I was able to get a job at EDS and I was just that I was just really fortunate to work for, for EDS at the time. And, um, this electronic data systems, this Ross Perot's company, a lot of people just know it as Ross Perot's company. And it was, it was the first IT outsourcing company. It was the first company that, that, that had the idea of, Hey, look, pick a company or pick an agency. Why are you out there buying all these computers? Why are you hiring programs? Why just just let us take that over for you? So they were the first IT outsourcing company, and I did start in, in finance with them and started in finance in the, the defense group. I uh, I took a lot. I did take a lot of Spanish in college, and so NAFTA was about to be approved. This was in the, the mid '90s in the Clinton administration, and EDS wanted to mature its um, Mexican subsidiary. Uh, thinking that the NAFTA was going to lead to a lot of growth. And so they sent a few Americans down um, and I was sent down to, to, to be CFO at 29 years old. Wow. And that was, that was EDS back then. It was just go, go, go. Just, and it was a ton of young people. Ross hired uh, a ton of folks out of college. And then you would learn the, the EDS way of doing things. And um, so, yeah, I lived and worked in Mexico City, you know, in my, in my late 20s. Which also was my way. I almost wanted to, to write to UVA. I said, "Remember when you turned me down and you wanted me to quit work in my late twenties to go back to you? Well, I'm CFO for an international subsidiary right now. <laughs> that's 
thanks to thanks to Virginia Tech. Uh, so I did that for a couple of years, and then they wanted me to stay international, and I think they wanted me to go to Sao Paulo, which was uh, we, we were also EDS was flag collecting at the time. They were they were trying to expand internationally. They were buying companies throughout Latin America, and I, I had worked on some of that. So they made Latin, they made Sao Paulo the Latin American headquarters. So they wanted me to be CFO for Latin America. But it was time for us to, to start a family. We had delayed that to go to Mexico City. And um, and so I wanted to come back to Virginia, but there really was no finance job left for me because I, you know, had basically done everything. And that's when that's when EDS said, Well, how about sales? You know, why, why don't you do, you know, we need a business developer in Army. Mm-hmm. And I said, Well, I'm your finance guy, not your BD guy. And I'd never served in the military. And they said, Hey, look, just try it. We think you're gonna do great. And um and I loved it, right? They, they moved me into that. Um, and then I was probably with the EDS for about 11 years. And I was getting to the point where I said, well, is there something else out there? Ross had long left the company at this point. Culture had changed. And so um, so I ended up um, doing something completely different and working in the data business. And this company was ChoicePoint, which is now part of LexisNexis. And it's kind of ubiquitous now, the type of data, but back then this, this was really rare, the kind of data that they had. And they did it for, you know, for financial purposes, for insurance underwriting. They weren't quite sure if the government would be interested in having the names, addresses, business relationships, you know, of everyone in the United States. And I said, they hired me and, and one and a colleague. And I said, uh, yeah, I think they would be very interested in that. And so, um, <laughs> So it just, it just took off and, uh, and we put data analytics on top of it. I don't even know if we called it data analytics back then, but it, we, really, we, we were really big data. This was in the late nineties, early two thousands. And then of course, nine eleven happened. And then, and then that, that whole industry just really, really took off, you know, as, um, you know, as we, as we were starting to counter terrorism in the country. So I, I, I did that about as, as long as I could and went back into, uh, government services and, was uh, was running day-to-day operations uh, for a company called DSA, small business. DSA is still out there. Um, and then a colleague of mine from EDS was at SAIC, and she called and said, hey, look, we're having a hard time you know, with DHS. We know that you're close to the DHS CIO at the time. You know, Would you want to come over and, and run one of the business units or be deputy for one of the business units? So I went over to SAIC um, and ran one of the business units for the for a number of years and then surprisingly SAIC at the time had gone public that didn't go very well um, the Obama administration was starting to focus more on domestic priorities not defense and intelligence and of course that was most of the revenue uh, government was getting really concerned about conflicts of interest SAIC had a ton of them not by design but just by the way we were organized or disorganized you know we didn't left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing and so the board said, look, we got to do something, you know, really radical. And so what they decided to do was split the company in two and they needed someone to, to run that. And they knew they needed a senior executive or people just wouldn't get off the ground. And so for some reason, they um, they asked me to run the SEIC Lido split, which amazing was 10 years ago. And um, and then wow, yeah, time flies. I know it really yeah. does. And then during that whole process, I didn't know which side I was going to. They I, I would like to think they. They knew I would be honest. I wouldn't stack the deck for one company or the other, depending where I was going to go. But I think they wanted to tell people, hey, look, he has no idea. He's he's not stacking the deck for one company or the other. And so, uh, but I had a feeling I would go to new SAIC. SAIC was actually the company that was spun off just because that was the government services, pure services entity. And um, and so came over and uh, initially I was going to be, I think, uh, the chief growth officer and then we were organized as a matrix. We wanted to break those business units apart. And so we went to a matrix organization and Debbie James was going to run the horizontals, which was the services side of the business. And just before split, Debbie came to us and said, um, Obama's asked me to be secretary of the air force. And we're like, <laughs> um, and you're going to turn him down. Right. And <laughs> Naturally. Said, no. <laughs> nope. So, uh, so she went to be secretary of the air force. And that's when Tony Morocco asked me, well, you know, why don't you come over and be president of the service lines? And, and Nozick was president of the, of the, of the, uh, of the verticals. And I was president of the horizontals and did that for a number of years. We were extremely successful. I think a lot of folks uh, under, 
um, undervalued us. They didn't realize how strong we were going to be coming out of the gate. We did really, really well. And so I did that for five years and then had the opportunity to retire because uh, my mom had passed a long time ago, but my dad's Alzheimer's was getting very advanced and I knew I was going to have to get in-home care or put him someplace. And so that's when I just said, look, again, only child. So he's all I have. Mom's passed. Um, so I was able to take advantage of, of retirement and take care of dad and glad I did that. And he's still, he's, he's still with us. And, um, and he's, he's at a uh, 100% dementia care, uh, facility in, in Alexandria. And so, um, so I was, I was done, you know, I was on a number of boards. Uh, I was on a great board. Thanks to Mark. Um, I was, I was one of my first boards was, was a placement that Mark had done. And I was very happy. And I just assumed my career was over. I was 52, I think, at the time when I retired. Wow. <laughs> and um, nice. in, enjoyed life, enjoyed being at the Beach House, and enjoyed being on boards. And COVID hits, and we're at the Beach House. That's where we're riding it out. And get a call, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark, from another executive search firm. Uh, if, if I had to pick the firm, I would have picked you, but I wasn't there. <laughs> and LMI had, uh, was looking for a new CEO. And again, I found out later that yes, the executive search firm called me, but it was actually one of my Virginia Tech friends had talked to our CHRO at LMI and said, look, this, here's the guy, you're never going to get him out of retirement, but this is the guy you really need to hire. And um, I don't know if you know Kim Shanahan. You probably know Kim, Mark. I do. I love Kim. So it was, it was Kim. And at first I said, I did say no. And they just said, look, just talk to the chairman and the vice chairman. And the chairman was Kim Krieg who had served in the Bush administration, uh, deputy secretary of defense. Mm -hmm. And the deputy chairman was Lisa Disbro, And Lisa was deputy secretary of the Air Force for my friend Debbie, right? So again, you get back into connections and networks and stuff. So we all immediately hit it off. We had a lot of connections and, and I really liked them. And so that whole summer of 2020, we were, we were talking and initially obviously gave me the offer and I accepted, but it was really strange. They hired a CEO without ever meeting me. It was 100% virtual, the entire board, all the interviews I had was all virtual. And so I started in August of 20 as, as a CEO of LMI. Brother, you have a great story, by the way. I, I you know, it's, it's, uh, I've heard it before and I still remember us talking. You were truly content to just be, Hey, I'll do board work. And, uh, and obviously that's what, you know, Debbie and Lisa are doing now. And, and, and some of the other folks you mentioned, they're, they're kind of doing the board circuit thing and either speaking or writing books or acting as an advisor to, you know, to a company with very sparing, you know, using their time sparingly and wisely. But, uh, but it was fortuitous for you to get that call. And, uh, and, and because, you know, you were very content and you were happy to, to, to kind of, to, to, to be out of, out of the game. And, and some folks kind of, they, when they leave the game, like, ah, feel like I need to come back in, you know, they don't say it overtly, but you can hear it in their voice. And, and, and that's a desire they have for you. You're really like, I'm good. Yeah. I, I don't need to do this. And in fact, I'm enjoying my myself right now. I feel better than I ever have. And, and then, uh, you know, you, you, you jump back in and, and, uh, and you and I talk shortly after that and you're like, okay, I guess I'm back in it. Back, and back, back. I think it's yeah, back in, in my perspective. It's been great. You know, and I, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad that I did. The LMI is just such a special place. I mean, it, it really, I know everyone thinks they're unique and, and but it, there's just really no place like it, you know, being around for 60 some years, being chartered by president Kennedy, so many years as a nonprofit, it is kind of a kind of gentler place. We really are focused on the solutions because that's when you're in a nonprofit, that's what you focus on. You, you, you know, you know, less, less of the, of the financials, even with that said, when I got there, I found, you know, a very mature, disciplined business. Um, so it really was not a, a fixer upper. Uh, I had a great leadership team I inherited. You know, I haven't felt that I, I didn't bring my own people. Uh, you know, I've never done that anyway, but because you should figure out how to go on the field with the team that you have. But yeah, it, it just, it's just been a, it's been a perfect environment and, and we're, you know, the team's killing it and we're doing really well and really, really fortunate to, to be in this role. Well, to be pulled in from pulled back in from a content retirement must mean you know the commitment to the to the company and the mission must be there. Otherwise, funny funny, funny funny story that I don't even think um, I don't think I've told I told the the board uh, the the old LMI board I didn't think I was going to get the job. 
Really? <laughs> yeah, because it was a very strong internal candidate. And Mark knows this, you know, a lot of companies, they'll, they'll do a search, even though they have a strong internal candidate, they'll do a search just to, so it validates, right, that this person really is the best person that's available. And so that's what I assume they were doing. And, and, and so the only person I knew on the board, I really had a relationship with, and actually my wife really had more of a relationship with him is Todd Stoudemire, oh. uh, because they both serve on um, the foundation board at William & Mary. Interesting. I mean, I knew Todd kind of knew him in, in circles, but, you know, those two have actually spent time together. And so I, I called Todd one day and I said, I said, hey, I appreciate the interviews. I think they're going well. But, you know, are you really serious, you know, about me? Because I know there's a strong internal candidate. He's like, hey, look, you're now the number one candidate. Right. So um, we know we have to work hard to get you out of retirement. But, you know, everyone's really comfortable with you and you're the number one candidate. So I hang up the phone and goes, what did Todd say? Todd says I'm the number one candidate, but he's full of it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and my wife's a CHRO. So she's like, if you're not serious about this, you better let them know. And I, and, and I was like, look, I get it. They need people to interview. I get it, but you know, I'm not going to get it with the job, which is fine. And then, um, the, uh, recruiter had set the expectation. He goes, look, the board's going to meet 10 o'clock on Saturday. If I were you, I'd be by the phone about 10 30 or so. Um, and my younger daughter and I were on our way to a wedding in West Virginia and the whole trip, my, my daughter's like, well, dad, are you really going back? And I said, it doesn't matter if I'm going back or not, because they're not going to choose me. Said, but what if they do <laughs> Don't you kind of have to say yes. And I said, let's cr I'll cross that bridge. Right. So we're pulling up to the church. It's 10, 15, pick up the phone and see it's the recruiter calling. I looked at my daughter. And I put on speaker and I said, honey, listen to daddy get shot down. And so I put on speaker and Brian goes, well, you can tell by the clock, they didn't deliberate for very long. Congratulations. They want you to be CEO of LMI. And my daughter starts cracking up. <laughs> and I think I said something like, uh, thank you. Uh, we're just pulling into the church. I'll call you back later. <laughs> <laughs> You probably don't remember anything that happened during that wedding. You're just thinking, oh, my oh gosh. Oh, my gosh. I, I, should have listened, I should have listened to everybody who told me I was the number one candidate. <laughs> but no, I, I had fallen in love with the board. They, they were just phenomenal people. And, and, and I, I didn't I really didn't deliberate. I just didn't I didn't have my hopes up. So I just didn't think it was really going to happen. But um, but no, I, I didn't deliberate for a second. And um, later that afternoon, I said, hey, let me give you a call on Monday and money. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm in. So. That's awesome. That's a great story. Especially to hear it from uh, Todd, another fellow uh, Humble Beginnings interviewee. He's, he, I tell you, Todd is a really special person. And I'm not just saying that because he's a board member of mine still. He, he really, really is. I mean, just such a great principal leader, uh, great emotional intelligence, great financial mind, business mind. He's done so many different things. Yeah, he's, he's really something special. So, uh, so Doug, considering, you know, you were a boss early on, you've kind of grown through this industry and you, and you sitting here as CEO, what would you tell rising professionals today who may not have a clear defined path um, as most don't, but who are kind of looking um, for the future and, and to be sitting in the seat that you are one day? So um, the first thing I would say is don't be concerned that you don't have a clearly defined path. Don't force yourself to have a clearly defined path. And I think that's more important today than even when I came up through my career. I think I, I was just lucky back when I was growing up in my career, they did want you to focus very, very early. And, and, and then, and it was a really well-defined pattern, right? It, it, they, they gave it to you. There was a very defined career path. You know, at LMI, our career path goes left to right and up and sometimes down and then back up. And so but that's, that's, I think that's how you be successful today. So first thing I would say is don't be concerned about that and don't pigeonhole yourself. Along with that, try to be a continuous learner, especially at the, at the pace of things changing right now. Number three, um, network, network, network. Um, I, I was fortunate. I essentially applied for one job in my career and that was, that was EDS. And every single job since then has been a relationship that someone's told me about or has pulled me in. And, and I, I do think that is, that is so important. If we had more time, I, I would love, love to talk about that, but I, I just think it's, it's very, very important to, to, to have that network. Um, and then also some advice my dad had given me 
you know, don't be afraid to do the dirty job, you know, the job that no one wants and, and, and see what you can turn it into. It's, um, you know, it may be, maybe no one wants it because it's hard or what have you, but usually leaders will see, you know, the effort that you put in and, and take something and turn it into something. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've had my share of dirty jobs, if you will, or difficult jobs, certainly splitting, you know, SEIC and Delitos, that was, that was a really tough year, but it was extremely rewarding. And, um, and, 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 you know, next to running LMI, you know, something I'm probably most proud of in my career. So that, that's, that's the, that's the advice I would give. Awesome. Man, solid, solid advice all the way around, my friend. Thanks for the time. Yeah. Great seeing you, Mark. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Did you know you can find podcast episode highlights, exclusive video interviews, and tons more Washington exec content on our YouTube channel? Subscribe to us on YouTube to keep up with our daily content. And don't forget to share and give a thumbs up. Thanks for listening.